Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, This morning we're going to wrap up our sermon series titled The Forgiving Challenge. And as we do, I want to kind of go back a little bit. If you haven't been with us, we're going to try to summarize the last five weeks in just a couple of minutes here. So we started off in week one with a reminder about what forgiveness is and why do we need to worry about forgiveness. And our operating principle that we unveiled in week one was this, forgiven people forgive people. You will typically do to somebody else that same thing that was done to you at one point in time in your life or another. So forgiven people will forgive people. If you understand how much you've been forgiven, you are more likely to be that way toward other people. And then we took it one step further and we said that forgiven people are free people. And so not only are you going to forgive other people, but you're also going to realize the the great freedom that comes from knowing that you've been forgiven. Now this morning, I want to go back and and go week by week through this. And and as we did this, we used the word scars. Maddie talked about it a minute ago in uh, the children's message. The the word scars has been an acronym, and it's been an illustration as we walked through this journey. The letters C, or S-C-A-R-S, I can't even spell, and it's right in front of me, (laughs) S is a reminder of our sin, and our sin are those, are those awful things that kind of tarnish our record. Now, a lot of times we view sin as those really, really big things. A lot of times we think of sin as those really big, ugly, we'll call them, one of my favorite phrases from going through pastor school was gross manifestations of lawlessness. Like, it just sounds awful, doesn't it? just sounds terrible. So I like using that one, so that's what we'll talk about. Sin are those, those really big, massive, ugly things that everybody knows are wrong, right? Like r- going, driving your car down the road and, and swerving onto the sidewalk to hit somebody on the sidewalk is a bad thing. We just don't do that. Walking up to somebody in the hallways at school and smacking them in the face just because you don't like what they're wearing is a bad thing, right? Those are sins, but sometimes, in, week, in our second uh, letter, the letter C, sometimes we realize that there are things in our lives that are, are there, but we don't know they're there, or, or nobody else knows they're there, and they're hidden in our lives. We used uh, your living room couch as an example for this one. Anybody here have a couch in their living room, or family room, or sit? Yeah, okay. Um, anybody like to eat popcorn? Yeah, so, so couch cushion confessions was, was that week, right? And that's where we realize that you can have people into your house and they can sit on your couch and they can, your house can be spotless until you lift up those couch cushions. I don't know how the, the popcorn can get down in between the cushions. Like, I don't get it. You touch, the current, you touch the thing in the bowl and it breaks into pieces. But somehow that same thing of popcorn can fall between the couch cushions that are married up against each other and it remains whole all the way down into your couch. I have no idea how it happens, but it does. Your couch is a miracle working thing. Right? So, so couch cushion confessions is digging beneath the surface in your life to realize there's something going on that you probably need to fess up to. These are those hidden moments in our lives. Then in the next two weeks, absolution and restoration, those are like the heads and the tails of a coin. They, they go hand in hand. And there are two definitions of forgiveness that we used. One is canceling a debt. So if you have a mortgage and someone walks up and they say, hey, I'm going to, um, your mortgage has been forgiven. That means it's paid in full. Anybody ever have that happen to them? Never mind. Um, I haven't. So if you have, just introduce me to the person, would you? Uh, So like, so here's here's the deal, right? Forgiveness is the canceling of a debt. You have a debt that you owe, and forgiveness is washing that clean. We know that that happens for us on the cross. When Jesus opens up his hands, he says the word from the cross, to telestai. Anybody know what it means? It is finished. It's actually a Greek word that is from a financial world that means it is finished or paid in full, which means your debt that's been canceled has been paid in full. But there's a second half of forgiveness that we talked about last week, and that's the restoration part. That deals with the anger, the bitterness, the rage, the resentment, all those evil, nasty things that go on inside of our hearts. And sometimes you can You can wipe away the debt, but there's still some sort of harboring of ill will inside of your heart. And so that's restoration, bringing you back to a right place again. And we've talked about that over the past five weeks. That's kind of where we've we've landed here in our time together on our message this morning. Is we're in this big church word, sanctification. 
Like we don't, I don't usually use words that are that big. For one, I, I, I don't spell well, and so if I can't spell it, I try not to say it. And so sanctification is a really big churchy word. And we've got another one that sounds similar to it. It ends similar to it. It's justification. So we've got these two really big words, and I'm going to unpack both of them really quickly and tell you what they are and tell you who the primary actor is in both of them. So, so justification is the process of being made right or being justified. If you ever typed a document and you had to left margin justify or right margin justify or that weird one where both margin justify and all the words get spaced out weird on the page. I don't know why that's a thing, by the way. My own personal pet peeve. Justify is when everything lines up in the right spot. And so justification is the process whereby God makes you line up in the right spot. And he puts you in the right place. And he does that by sending his son to die for you. That's the forgiveness and restoration piece. Now the second word is, it, it's kind of weird because we don't like to talk about it because it sounds confusing. Because this is the process of being made holy. And, and growing up I wrestled with this because I didn't know who did this. Like, who makes me holy? Because sanctification, as I was taught growing up, was something I had to do. I had to live a sanctified life. Well, goodness, people, I don't know if you know me, but I am not a holy person. I mean, I can wear jeans that have holes in them, but that does not make me holy. And so how am I a holy person? The same one who justifies me sanctifies me. You see, sanctification is not something I do, but rather it's something that's done unto me. It's a work that God works inside of me continuously, daily, over and over and over again. It is God working inside me and through me so that I can begin to look more and more like Jesus to the world. You see, t today, today I, I, I want you to understand something. Today I, I want you to, to understand that the baptism that you saw this morning was a great illustration of this very point. It was a great illustration of Jesus doing everything. The baptism that we witnessed this morning, that's one of the reasons why baptism is one of my favorite things in, in ministry to do, is because it is 100% completely, totally all about God's work for me. Real quick, um, what role did Blair Pitt play in her baptism this morning? The cute part, other than that. Nothing. She did nothing. That's why I love infant baptism, right? This is we, we have these struggles, right? Because we think we've got to do something. But we believe in infant baptism, baptism whereby God does everything for us. He begins the work and completes the work. And we believe that what God began here in this moment, he'll bring to completion in his day and in his way. And so baptism is, is God coming into your life and into my life and saying, look, this is, this is what I'm doing. This, this is the moment that everything starts. So God entered into Blair in that moment. And as God enters into Blair in that moment, he begins a work that he will complete. But what about you and me? He doesn't just start the work. He finishes the work. And so we've been walking with We've been walking with Peter in the last two chapters of John's Gospel, and we're going to join up with uh, Peter again. So if you remember where we've been, this is kind of the journey we've been on. Um, Peter was at the fire, and he denied knowing Jesus in the courtyard while Jesus was on trial. He denied even knowing Jesus, and as he denied knowing Jesus, he... he was grieved in his heart. He started to get really, really sad. He ran away and he cried and he got super sad. And then later on, he goes back to fishing and he's out in the, out in the water fishing all night long. He catches nothing. And as he catches nothing, he realizes maybe I'm not as good of a fisherman as I thought I was because that's what he was supposed to be doing. That's what his job was. And this man on the shore, who we know later on to be Jesus, this man on the shore says, hey, throw your net seven and a half feet to the other side and cast your nets on the other side of your boat. And they do, and, and they catch fish. Anybody know how many fish they catch? 153. Anybody know why it's 153? Because they counted them. 
It has no biblical significance whatsoever. There's no, there's, there, really, there is no rhyme or reason as to why that is the only place in the Bible that actually occurs anywhere in the Bible. So it's just they counted them. A lot of fish. That's what it means. It's a lot of fish. And so it's 153 fish. And Peter looks on shore and he realizes because John tells him, hey, look, that's Jesus. And so Peter does the crazy thing and he puts his coat on and jumps in the water and he swims all the way up to Jesus. And he shows up soaking wet, sandy, and seaweed covered. And he stands in front of Jesus and Jesus says, hey, Peter, do you love me? He welcomes him in to eat breakfast by the fire of fish charbroiled over a charcoal fire, char cooked over a char charcoal fire. And he says, hey, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yep, I like you. Because that's the difference in wording. We talked about this last week. And so, so we have Jesus saying, hey, hey Peter, do you love me? And, and Peter says, yep, I like you. He says, feed my sheep. And the second time he says, hey, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yep, I kind of like you. Jesus says, take care of my lambs. And the third time, Jesus says, hey, Peter, do you, um, do you like me? And Peter says, yeah. Yeah, I like you. He says, feed my sheep. He doesn't, he doesn't condemn him. He doesn't put him down. He doesn't make him relive that moment. He just, he relieves him of that moment, and he sets him on this brand new path. And so here we are. We're right after that event, and we're in John chapter 21, verse 18. And this is what happens right after Jesus says, right after Jesus says, Go feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you. Now, these are, these are Jesus' words. I highlighted some of these words in red for those of you with us here. Uh, and so these are just to highlight a, an idea and a thought. They're not highlighted in Scripture. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, talking to Simon Peter, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. See, that's what... What, what Jesus is telling Peter is that there was a moment in your life when, when you made your own decisions. There was a moment in your life, Peter, when, when you could choose whether or not you were going to follow. You could choose how you were going to follow. You could choose whether you were going to do the, the Jesus thing one minute and, and the worldly thing the next minute. You could choose. And that was, that was, that was okay. But when you are old, middle of the way through the verse, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and will carry you where you do not want to go. See, what Jesus is doing is Jesus is saying to Peter, for a long time, you were willing to just kind of go halfway into this thing. For a long time, you were willing to follow me halfway. For a long time, you said you were all in, but your actions showed something totally different. And I'm going to tell you, from this point forward, Peter, everything is going to change for you. From this point forward, you're going to go all in and you're going to be forced to do things by the world that you never thought you'd be able to do. And so he's actually, he's actually predicting what's going to happen to Peter. He says, he says they're, going to, they're going to dress you in clothes you didn't want to be dressed with, and they're going to draw your hands out to the sides and make you do things you don't want to do and go places you don't want to go. He's talking about the way Peter is going to die. And he knows this from experience because Jesus was led to a place he didn't necessarily want to go. Because in the garden, Jesus said, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. He was put in clothing he didn't want to wear. Jesus was stripped of his robes and he was placed in a garment that would allow him to die on a cross. His arms were stretched out to either side. Peter would be crucified on a cross years later. After Jesus says these things, years later, Peter would have his arms stretched out on a cross, would be stripped of his clothing, would be led to a place where the crucifixions would occur. And as tradition has it, through some of our church fathers, Origen and others like him, Peter didn't feel that it was right for him to die the same way Jesus died, so he asked to have his cross inverted. So Peter was placed upon a cross with his arms outstretched, stripped of his own clothing, upside down. And that's how Peter died. See, Jesus said these things to show Peter exactly what kind of death he was going to die that would glorify God. And after he said this, he says to Peter, follow me. A few minutes ago, we saw Blair begin a process. A process was started inside of Blair, the same process that was, in started, that was started in many of you. Some of you might remember your baptism. Some of you, like me, probably don't. I was baptized several weeks after I was born, and I don't have a clue what happened. But I know that God did something miraculous and mysterious, and ever since then, God's been saying, hey, follow me. And some days I'm like, yep, God, let's do this thing. 
But other times, yeah, I got a better idea, God. Can you just kind of like hang out and wait? I've got to get some affairs together first. See, Peter wrestled with this very thing, and it's the process of sanctification working inside of us where, where we are led places we don't necessarily want to go, where we're pulled out of the world to live a different kind of life. In this forgiving challenge, this is where we're going to land in our time together. God is calling us to be different. He's calling us to stand out. He's calling us to be the people that he wants us to be. And you don't have to go far to realize exactly what this is going to look like. Because for Peter, all you've got to do if you've got a paper version of your Bible and you're looking at John 21 verse 19, turn the page and you'll end up in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, beginning at chapter 2, verse 14, you begin to see something pretty fantastic and pretty phenomenal. Because in Acts 2, 14, we see Peter doing what Peter hasn't done up until now. And Peter standing with the eleven. Really important part here is, one, it's Peter, it's not Simon, because remember, he was Simon, and God changed his name to Peter, but he reverted back to Simon, and now he's living the Peter kind of life again. And so God calls him to become Peter again. He calls him to do something miraculous and mysterious, just like he does for you and for me. And so Peter's standing with the eleven, standing there with the eleven. The eleven are really important. The eleven are known as the disciples. These are the people who had Peter's back. These are the people who would have understood exactly what Jesus was calling Peter to do. And it's important that Peter is standing with the eleven, because with the eleven, he has the strength of the body of Christ. And so Peter is standing, a posture of authority and a posture of action, standing with the eleven, with the brotherhood, lifted up his voice. This is fantastic. Every time up until now, Peter has cowered away when he was called to speak. When he was by that charcoal fire, the very voice that would deny Jesus would be the one that would proclaim Jesus. He lifted up his voice and he addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. You see what's happening in this moment is God is showing us that he can use the sins of our past to accomplish his purpose in our future. The very voice that denied Jesus was the voice that would proclaim him. And all you've got to do is keep turning the pages in the New Testament, and you're going to see page after page, story after story, account after account, interaction after interaction of how Peter would use his voice to proclaim the mercy and the grace and the goodness of God. It's not enough just to be forgiven. That's what makes this challenge so important. It's not enough just to be forgiven. It's not enough just to know that you are a forgiven people. You see, forgiven people have to look different. Forgiven people have to act different. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I, I, don't, I don't know if you really understand. Maybe you do. I don't know if you understand the weight of everything that's happening in Peter's life. I don't know if you understand exactly what happened in your own baptism. And what happens every time you come here to take communion and every time you gather together in worship, I don't know if you quite get exactly what's happening. Because Jesus, all over again, all over again, calls you by name and says, follow me. He takes the sins of your past and he gets rid of them and he uses that very thing and he says, I'm going to use that to purify you and to set you apart for a purpose. And so God is constantly in the business of sanctifying you and making you holy, not because of you, but in spite of you. And just like Blair played no part in her own baptism, you play no part in your own sanctification aside from obedience. All Blair did was lay there and let water be poured upon her and the Spirit of God rushed through her and her whole entire identity changed. For you and me, sometimes it's about obediently going where God says go. It's obediently standing when God says stand. It's obediently proclaiming the truth of God's word when God says now is the time. There's no sin too big for God to forgive. There's no gap too wide for God to bridge. There's no division so vast that God can't bring it back together again because God is in the business of freeing people with forgiveness because forgiven people forgive people. My prayer for you today as we wrap up our series and as we move into the season of Thanksgiving and Advent and Christmas 
is that you would let God take the moments of your past and to turn you toward a future. That you would see the fact that God not only substituted his son's life for you, but he gave you victory today. It's not just about a moment off in the distance. It's about a moment right here, right now, where God wants you to look and to live different. He wants to accomplish his purpose in you right now. That's what obedience looks like. That's why God calls us in Matthew chapter 28 to make disciples by baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and teaching obedience to all that I have commanded you. My prayer is that you hear the words of God read in the scriptures, that you interact with those words of God uh, or with other people who believe like-minded as you, that you stand with the 11, whoever your 11 are, and that you proclaim with the voice God gave you his purpose for your future. And may God who began this good work in you bring it to completion in his day and in his way. Would you pray with me? Gracious God and Father, as we stand before you today, we are reminded of the miracle that you worked in us in the moment that we were baptized, called as your children, when we played no role, no part whatsoever. Lord, remind us that you work in spite of us when we don't deserve it. When we are weak, you are strong. You lavish us with all of your good gifts. And so, Lord, now may that work that you began in us in the moment that we, we saw your face, in the moment that we, we heard your message, in the moment that we received your spirit into our lives, may that work be carried on to completion. Strengthen us. Allow us to stand firm upon the convictions of our faith. And may we speak boldly of your love and mercy and grace and truth. And Father, as we come here in a moment to take part in communion, may we, we receive inside of ourselves the, the, the reminder of your death and resurrection. May we remember constantly what you have done to bring healing to our souls, forgiveness to us that we might be a forgiving people. Father, give us the strength to live as your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.